Today, we will be in Nehemiah chapter 1. So if you have a Bible or a device through which to access said book, Nehemiah, grab it. Open up there, Nehemiah chapter 1. We will be looking at this chapter in this book through a verse-by-verse dynamic today. Um, And our goal is to navigate all 11 verses of Nehemiah chapter 1. And I'll be reading and teaching from the New Living Translation. Uh, If you have a device where you can choose the different translations that you're looking at, you can check that out. If you don't have a Bible and you say, you know, I sure would love a Bible, well, go buy one. Well, you know, but also... If you don't have one, I can't buy one. Well, then we'd love to gift you a New Testament at the very least, even though we're in the Old Testament. But, um, you know, great little Bible here called the New Believers Bible. If you don't have one, would encourage you to um, speak with Tabitha or Pastor Joe or really anybody out there at that Connect desk after church. We'd love to put a Bible in your hands if really some way you don't have access to one. so that would be great. It'd be the best thing in the world we could ever give you on a Sunday is a Bible. Does anyone agree with that? Like the best thing? Yes, I think so. Well, Nehemiah chapter 1. It really is a joy to be able to open up this book with you this morning. Um, it's our hope in studying this book together that as we navigate this book over this winter and over this spring, that we will, to an even greater degree, not only see, but believe in our attitudes and actions, our ABCs, attitudes, beliefs, and choices, that Jesus really does rebuild, that Jesus really does restore. And it's my hope and my prayer that we will together see this. And let me just put it in these realms, spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally, that we will to a greater degree when we reach the end of May 2021. So you know what? I see evidence in the scriptures, in individual lives, in my marriage, in my heart, in my mind, that Jesus really does restore, that he rebuilds. And here's where I want you to attach that faith to our sermons. No, no, no. To the word of God. That your trust would not be in what I say or some alliterated quote or some acrostic or some rhyme or what Pastor John says. But that in 10 months, five years, 10 years, when you navigate something that you did not expect, when you encounter a relationship that has unfortunately experienced relational death, you would be able to step in it with this mindset. I know that Jesus can rebuild and restore. How? How do you know that? The book of Nehemiah. Because if your faith is attached to the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God, you will find yourself not so often indisposed, if that makes any sense, that you'll navigate, you'll pivot, you'll learn, you'll begin to not just survive in life, but thrive, no matter what's happening around you physically, emotionally, relationally, or even mentally, because your faith will be in that which God has inspired Pastors are wonderful. I know some of them. But pastors come and go. God's word stands forever. So may our faith be in that which lasts. God's word. This is why we are focused on what I truly to be, believe to be the central theme of the entirety of God's word. It's not you. It's not me. It's not even good old Nehemiah. It's Jesus. Jesus truly is the central focus of the scriptures. This is all about him. It all points to him. 
And each book of the Bible gives a unique perspective or insight into his character, in his nature, and in his work. It's about Jesus. And Nehemiah, ultimately, will see that Jesus is the hero of the story. See, I don't know, do you remember this from last Sunday when we watched that video about kind of the overview and a guy that just has so much to say, you're like, this is like a 10 fire hydrant kind of a guy. You know how when you talk to some people, you're like, I just drank from a fire hydrant, I feel like. Well, that guy's got like 10. He just keeps coming at you. Visually and verbally, he's got a lot to say. But when we, when we considered that last Sunday, I don't know if you remember this, but where the book of Nehemiah ends is not awesome. Like Nehemiah, even though he does some amazing things and we learn some phenomenal lessons in leadership, at the end of the day, he'd have to go see the HR department. You say, why? He's pulling people's hair out. He's yelling at them. Can you imagine showing up to your Monday? You go to work, you come home. And your wife says, hey, you're looking a little lighter on top than than usual. What happened? Well, the boss, I'll tell you what happened today. He went on a hair pulling out dynamic. Like, he just went for it. He was upset. He's yelling at us. And that's where Nehemiah ends up. Jesus doesn't. Jesus had his hair pulled out on your behalf. (laughs) He doesn't pull out your hair because of your behavior, so to speak. So Jesus. And here's the thing. In this book of Nehemiah, Pastor John and I plan to basically navigate one chapter a week. So so today will be chapter one. We're going to see that there's a tremendous amount of physical work to be done. The wall needs to be rebuilt. In fact, I love this. It's kind of even our logo. I don't know if you're kind of seeing it where it's a, a shovel and a sword. Like in one hand, they built the wall and the other, they fought off the enemy. Like these guys are working. And the book of Nehemiah shows us that it took all of God's people giving their all to see the work done. Well, so too spiritually, here's the deal. Jesus has a work that has yet to be done. We find it in Matthew's gospel, chapter 28. It's actually a a mission statement that you are commissioned to join Jesus in. And let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. It is the job description of your life if you're a believer. It's very difficult to know what to do in a job if it's not described. And some of us as believers say, well, I guess this is my job description. Passions, pursuits, pleasures. Anything else that starts with a P, I guess? I'm trying to think. I don't know. No. You have a job description. You are to go, therefore, and make disciples in Jesus' name, teaching them to observe all the things that Jesus taught, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then as ministry begins to happen, you should start worrying about it, start freaking out about it, start playing. No, you know what? Don't worry. You know why? Because Jesus said, all authority and in heaven on earth has been given to me. This is the job description of your life. Are you staying in the lanes of the described lifestyle that you've been ascribed to as a disciple? Did you know that the word disciple comes from the word disciplined? That to be a disciple means to live a disciplined life in the direction of the one who gave you life. That, that, that are, we don't discipline to receive life. No, 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 that's religious duties. And the more you do, 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 you start to feel like this whole Jesus thing is doo-doo. You know, it stinks. This isn't no fun. No, no, no. Christianity is all about what he's done. And because of what he's done, he can do with me as he desires. In Nehemiah, we recognize that God desires all of his people to work together. All of them. Just like a body in 1 Corinthians 12. See, quite simply, Nehemiah, if you were to ask me, is about the person, the work, and the people of God. And as we begin chapter one today, let me ask this question. Let me see if you're familiar with some of this. You ever heard of like um, the Chinese language? A couple people. How about this side, right side of the room? You heard of the Chinese language? Okay, yes. Left side, you ever heard of the Taiwanese language? You ever heard of that? No one? Okay, Thai maybe. Man, hello. Okay. Well, 
There's another language that sometimes seems very foreign. It's called Christianese. You ever heard that language? Like language in church, like, where, what is this? Is that the Bible? Like, where does this come from? Like, all these, like, you know, statements, like, bless her heart. No, that's not in the Bible. It's more Southern. But I'm not going to get into all these phrases. But here's one phrase that you'll hear in the church. And I think these three that I'm about to say are, are awesome. Awesome. Here's one. Have you heard this one? Christianity is not a religion about Jesus, but a relationship with Jesus. Anyone ever heard that one? Like, it's not religion, it's relationship. How many of you say, I agree with that? I agree with that, yes. I think it's about a relationship with Jesus. It's not about, remember the do, 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 right? That's, we're not doing do, do here. We're doing what Jesus has done here. That's what this is about. Well, here's a second one that I think is awesome. Here it is. When you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. We'll unpack that more momentarily. And then number three for today. It's not about your ability with God, but about your availability to God. Or let's, it's, sometimes let's put it this way. God equips the called. He doesn't necessarily call the equipped. Does that make sense? Like God's looking for a hand to go up. I'll help. Lord, what can I do? He's not looking for a stellar job description going, oh, you used to work with uh, Jay-Z. I can use you in music. No, that's not what it is. You know, like, God, I'm here. I can make a joyful noise. And then we'll say, well, then go talk to Rob. We'll see if it's a, a, a joyful noise that other people think is joyful. You know, like <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, and we'll let Rob decide that, not me. Um, well, see, here's the deal. In Nehemiah chapter one, we're going to have an opportunity to consider these three phrases, relationship, not religion. When you don't know, do what you know. And God's looking for availability, not necessarily ability. We're going to see that in Nehemiah chapter 1 today. But let me say this as a precursor. Today we will not be discussing what this book is about, why it is written, and how we plan to go through it. If those questions pique your interest and at the end of this time together you go, I don't know where we are. Well, last Sunday we spent some time considering those questions. And I would encourage you wholeheartedly and genuinely to check that content out because it will be a better framework for you to understand what today is about. You know that when you show up to a movie late, well, nowadays everything's streamed, but years ago when we used to go to these things called movie theaters, remember that? And like, you'd go in, it's like, oh, who's talking here? What's going on? Like, you don't want to do that with the Bible. Like, you want to step into it, go, oh, I showed up before the movie started. I know what's going on here. I know the history. I know what kind of book of literature this is. If you're interested in all that, check it out from last Sunday. But this Sunday... Let's turn in our Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 1. I'm going to ask you all to stand because I would love to, out of respect for God's word, have a stand and hear the word of God read. And I'll read the entirety of chapter 1 from the New Living Translation. We'll pray and then we'll spend six hours in Bible study. Sound good? No, we won't. We'll just do a little couple minutes. Nehemiah chapter 1, starting in verse 1 from the New Living Translation. This is how the text reads. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I, speaking in the first person as Nehemiah, was at the fortress of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit me with some of the other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned there from captivity, about how things were going in Jerusalem. And this is what they said to me. Things are not going well for those who returned to the province of Judah. In fact, they're in great trouble and disgrace. And the wall of Jerusalem has been torn down. And the gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4, Nehemiah writes, When I heard this, I sat down and I wept. In fact, for days I mourned and fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. And now we're given insight into this prayer language of Nehemiah, starting in verse 5. He says, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him, and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly. 
by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant Moses. If you're unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. Verse 10. The people you rescued by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those who are delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it in his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. You may be seated. Father, as your people are being seated and as we've heard your word read, we ask in humility that by your spirit you'd speak through your word so that not only could we learn your word, but that we could begin to live it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, every good story has to set the setting. My wife loves Disney World. Is that correct? Yes. My daughters love Disney World. Is, is that correct? Yes. My, my boys They love Disney World. They love it. Therefore, we'll be there on someday next week, I think. Is it Thursday of next week? Something like that, yeah. It's a thing that they love. Now, many tales that are told by Walt Disney begin with this phrase. Maybe you know it. Once upon a time. In the land of Nod, even. I don't know what story that's from, but that's somewhere. Now, you may be in Nod right now because you're in a sermon. I'm Nod. But there's this dynamic of introduction, right? And it's like it whisks you away to a time and place and setting and scene that is oh so whimsical. But oh so fake. It's not real. Like, I I mean, my daughters are waking up to, wait, that's not the real Ariel. You know what I mean? Like, that's not, who's that guy in that stormtrooper? You know these are, these are pretend. This is fantasy. It's fun. It's okay to use imagination and take a little break sometimes from reality. But, but those aren't real. I hope I'm not bursting any bubbles here, but Darth Vader, you know, that's not, you're not, he's not a real guy. Here's what I love about this text. That is not the way this opens. This is a historical account. This, these are the memoirs, the, the journalings, the writings, the scribblings, the thoughts, the experiences, the dynamics, the situations that an actual historical person encountered. And you can dig through the history books to say, well, when did this guy Artaxerxes reign? Oh, there it is. You can go dig in the dirt 150 miles north of the Persian Gulf and go, okay, that's where Susa was. Like, this is not the land of Nod. This is a literal place. This is the thing I love about the Bible. The Bible purports a correspondent theory of truth. Not every religion does so. So what do you mean? That that which this says corresponds to reality as we can best connect it to. That when it says something that's mathematical, when it says something that's historical, even though this is not a book of mathematics, thank the maker, I don't want to do that, or like, a book of history where it speaks of such things, it is accurate. This happened in a real time, in a real place. Nehemiah, we're not told much about him, really his childhood, youth, or family background. The only thing we know is the name of his dad and his brother there in verses 1 and 2. We're left to maybe assume or perhaps we can infer that maybe his great parents were potentially taken into captivity when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. And most likely, he was born in Persia during the time of Zerubbabel's ministry in Jerusalem. See, the story begins in Susa, again, 150 miles north of modern-day Persian Gulf. And at this time in history, the Persian Empire was in control, and Susa 
was what New York City used to be in 2019. Remember that a long time ago? Like, wow, the place. Now it's the space where everyone's, no one, get out of there, man. It was seen as the, the place to be. Susa, the capital. Potentially, this guy, Nehemiah, that's what he's born into. He maybe knows his bit of his history, his family tree, but what he knows by nature and nurture and culture is to live in Persia. Like if, if it was Super Bowl Sunday and the Susanites were fighting the whoever, the Babylonianites or whatever, he's going for Susa, right? He's the guy. He was born there. That's his hometown, so to speak. The timing of this story is in that era when the Jews begin to return to their homeland. Again, check out the content from last Sunday, but this happens in three stages, and we're in stage three here in Nehemiah. Hanani, Nehemiah's brother, well, he returns to Susa from Jerusalem for a visit. What happens? To get like kosher shish kebabs? Is that why they're there? I don't know, maybe. Maybe Susa had some great shish kebabs. I have no idea, but. They begin to talk about what's going on in Jerusalem. And look at verses 2, well, through 3. He says, listen, bro, things aren't good. The walls are down. The gates are on fire. The people are under attack. Distress, death, destruction, despair. It's like he's turning on the news, right? Like that's what's happening. It's not good. So you know what Nehemiah could have done in this moment? He could have asked this simple question. Does this directly impact me or my family or finances? No. So I don't care. Some of us act that way. It doesn't directly impact me. Who cares if thus and so is happening in thus and so place? That's not what Nehemiah does. He, he, he's impacted emotionally. He's distressed. He starts to, to weep physically. He doesn't embrace if, nothing against if, intermittent fasting, but he starts to fast. Like it's not for health reasons. He's like, I can't eat. I am distressed. I need to seek the Lord. And spiritually he begins praying for days, it says. He's weeping. He's not eating. He's praying. Hey, let me have your attention. Let me see your eyes. Eventually, life is going to hit. It can't be all cupcakes and rainbows, right? There's valleys in life. And valleys are important because that's where fruit is produced. There's no, no fruit at the mountaintop. It's too high. But where the growth comes is in the valley. And it's where most of life is spent. It's meant to. So you're not necessarily disobedient because you're walking through a difficulty. You're just alive. And when life hits, the bridge is out, COVID, or maybe your pet's heads are falling off, like whatever happens, right? Like, here's the question. What do you do? Do you react or do you respond? Who do you talk to first when a challenge hits? Is it the horizontal plane or the vertical? Where do you go when someone brings accusation, imagination, speculation, declaration that may bring defamation to your character or good name? What do you do? Do you go, I got to straighten this out? Or do you do what we see in the text today? In verses 4 through 11, you know what Nehemiah does? He processes and prays, processes and prays when a dynamic hits that he didn't expect. Has anyone ever had anything in life happen that you didn't see coming? Okay, Rob again. Okay, Rob. Last week, last, last service, Rob got saved. It was awesome. But <laughs> we'll explain that later. But, I mean, we've all had those dynamics. Man, I just didn't see that coming. It doesn't make you less than. It makes you human. That, that's, we're all like that. Nobody sees everything except for one guy. And in verses 4 through 11, we're given this powerful prayer. 
Now we've already read through that prayer, but I'd like to highlight for you note takers 10 things that I see in this prayer. I'm gonna share them with you. If you're like, man, those are 10 things that I'd like to see written down, talk to Tabitha after the service. She has access to the teaching notes. She can send you a copy if that's helpful. But I want you to catch this. There are 10 elements in this prayer that if, in my opinion, you'd kind of fall into the same way Nehemiah does, I would say, it's just an opinion, you're learning how to have an effective prayer life. Here they are, number one, humility. Nehemiah humbly and reverently addresses God. When something hits, is your first verbal reaction maybe an explicative, right? Like, or is it, God, you're creator, I'm created. I need to make sure I, I see pers- things accurately. Because he, 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 here's the deal. Perspective impacts priorities. And when you see things accurately, only then and then alone can you start to prioritize correctly. And most of us forget that we're not God. Most of us forget that life's not about us. Most of us forget that there's actually some people that have it worse off than I do. Most of us forget that. Most of us haven't been to Haiti and see kids mix sand and sugar and call that breakfast. Most of us don't see that. We just complain that Taco Bell left and we can't get our breakfast burrito anymore, right? Right? Most of us lack perspective. But here's the deal. Nehemiah humbly and reverently addresses God. That's the first key. Number two, truth. He identifies God as merciful who keeps his covenants with the faithful. See, and here's the deal. There's a, there's a challenge before him. And he could begin to, to complain to God and say, this is what I see. How could you? Blah, blah. No, you know what he does? Humility and truth. God, you are merciful. And you are the God that keeps your covenants. This is good. Number three. <sighs> There's an element of clarity to this prayer. That's why I think things should be written down. Because all writing is, is thinking clearly. That's all it is. Nehemiah asked our loving God to hear and to listen. Aren't you glad Nehemiah wrote some things down? I'm stoked about it. I mean, give me something to do on a Sunday, right? Like teach the Bible. But there's clarity. There's truth. There's humility. And number four, there's personal confession. Read through that prayer. He says, God, I have sinned. My family and I. He, he doesn't step into a prayer going, what's, I'm, I'm good here, God. What's going <laughs> on? No. When I stand before a holy God, I realize how unholy I am. Number four, there's personal confession. Number five, there's corporate confession. He confesses and even says, we're responsible for the blatant sin of Israel. We disobeyed you. And you said in your word that disobedience would bring bondage. We're busted. Like this is on us. Number six, there's justice. He acknowledged that God had justly scattered the unfaithful Jews. Like these are hard truths. But number seven, here's what I love He says, but you know what, God? I love that you're an honest God. What do you mean by that? He reminds God of the gracious promise to restore Israel if the people repented. I don't think God forgot. Do do you think that he's like, oh yeah, thank you so much, Nehemiah. I'm glad you're on my team. I forgot that I promised that. You know what he's doing? He's recounting scripture and realigning his perspective with the truth. And oftentimes that's what prayer is. It's not so much about me getting my will done on earth as much as it is getting God's will, which is in heaven, done on earth. And I constantly need my mind aligned. I do. Maybe you're awesome and you've memorized this and you just, every day, you're like, I got this, man. I don't need all these 10 points. Awesome. You can teach next week if my dad will let you. He's up next week. But anyway, honesty. Number eight, history. Why? What do you mean by history? He reminds God and himself that God has redeemed Israel in the past. This isn't new. Like, God has delivered his people before. History, looking back on the faithfulness of God. Number nine, there's a request. 
He asks God to hear his prayer. Let me just say this. God already knows what you're scheming and planning and thinking. So just be honest with the guy. Just tell him, don't bring ambiguous agendas to God. That's the worst, you know, if you like, if you know what it's like to have children or you know what it's like to like lead people and like, can't really tell the agenda here. Ambiguous agendas are nobody's friend. And, and so here's what happens. He's just honest with his request. He says, God, hear my prayer <laughs> and, and that of your servants. Rescue us. And here's what I love. Point number 10. <clears throat> he releases it. He trusts God. He says, God, give me favor in the presence of this man. He releases it. God, it's up to you now. I'm trusting you. See, here's the deal. In Philippians chapter four, the apostle Paul speaks to those that I believe that may be sitting in this room. So what do you mean by that? You're a worrier. Because God's called you spiritually to be a prayer warrior. And this is what prayer is like. It's like muttering. That's what worry is like, right? It's like, it's always there. It's like, I just got... That's what prayer is supposed to be like. Like the second spiritual language in which you're always connecting with your father. And maybe you're embracing these, some of these 10 things like, I'm just speaking truth. I'm, I'm, I'm requesting of God. I'm, I'm, I'm approaching it in humility. I'm <clears throat> and here's what the devil does. I'll twist that. I'll take one who's meant to be a warrior and turn them into a warrior. You know if you're called to be an intercessor, why? Because right now you're worrying about, when's this guy going to be quiet so I can get that crock pot going? You know, like, you're thinking about a thousand other things. Well, wake up. Don't be distracted. The enemy's out to distract you and diffuse your potential. Take your worries and turn them into prayers. Because one who's a constant worrier is an indicator to me that you're called to be an intercessor. And that's why the enemy's after you. Because if he can get you to worry and not be the warrior you're called to be, he's won half the battle. Because I firmly believe that if we had more warriors in prayer than creatives behind a screen, we would get more done spiritually. Do we need the creatives? Absolutely. Do we need the theologians? Absolutely. Do we need plumbers? Absolutely. Right? Where would we be without plumbers? Amen? Like, We'd be sad. That's where we would be. But anyway, <laughs> we need everyone doing their part. But I firmly believe that oftentimes battle is won in prayer. And so many people think, try to think outside the box before they know how to think inside the book. Get your priorities straight. Stop trying to be creative. And be a person of the book. Because once you know this, and then the creativity comes that is otherworldly, that you can't muster up, that you don't even know where it comes from. But when you're inside the book, then you can be outside the box. But not until then. Get to know God's word. If you want to go fast, then just go for it. If you want it to last, be faithful in the little things. For it's in those little things that you learn how to navigate the more difficult things. See, these 10 dynamics in prayer are truly a message in themselves. But I told you that there were three phrases that I wanted to consider. Do you remember that from like 20 minutes ago? Well, let's consider them and then let's close this down for today. Christianity is not a religion about Jesus, but a relationship with Jesus. Remember that phrase? Anyone kind of still hearing that? Yep, okay, good. What we learn from Nehemiah, specifically in verses 5 through 11, is that his relationship with God was personal for him. It was personal. He was passionate about it. You ever been passionate about something? I see it in my sons. Leonidas. Leonidas loves trash truck. Does anyone else have a two-year-old and knows what that means on Netflix? Okay, you know. Man, they know how to bait that hook. The kid like, I'm in, trash truck, like every day. And so anywhere we're driving, dad, trash truck, dad, trash truck. And it's not a trash truck, it's just a truck. But in his mind, like, they got him, man. They marketed that thing to death. Anything that's big, he's trash truck, trash truck, trash truck, trash truck. They got him. He's passionate about it. We had to buy all these trash trucks for Christmas, and they're everywhere now. Like, 
small ones, medium ones, big ones. They're everywhere. Trash truck is our life. Hopefully, that'll change. You know, there'll be some other marketing thing that someone will come out with, and now it'll be whatever. That's how it is. Well, here's what I find. Passion. It comes all about it. Well, here's the deal. Nehemiah loved God. It exuded from him. That's why when he heard that his homeland was in destruction, it impacted him. He had a relationship with God. It wasn't about titles. It wasn't about It wasn't about impressing people. It was about expressing to people who God is. That's who Nehemiah was. I'm telling you, not everybody's like that. Some people are there to impress you with cleverness. I'm just telling you, for Nehemiah, he cared about the people, not about his vision. He had a relationship with God. Now, I'm going to share with you a good resource. Now, here's how I have to precursor every resource other than this resource that I ever recommend. I don't think that this resource has all the answers. I don't think that this resource is perfect and inerrant and infallible and inspired. I only think one collection of writings is the 66 books of the Bible. But there's this really helpful resource called Got questions.org you can get it on an app or you can go to the website but it works kind of like google for bible questions remember that milk ad got milk and he's like aaron burr aaron no nobody okay well i think that's kind of where it comes from gotquestions.org if you type in relationship not religion i wanted to read this to you because i thought it was just awesome listen to what this says religion is the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God or gods, plural. In that respect, Christianity could be classified as a religion. However, practically speaking, Christianity has a key difference that separates it from other belief systems that are considered religions. What's the difference? Relationship. Christianity is not about signing up for a religion, this article says. Christianity is about being born into the family of God. John chapter 3, verse 3. It's a relationship. Just as an adopted child has no power to create an adoption, we have no power to join the family of God in our own efforts. It's not like, well, if you just do this, do that, do this, do that, then you're in. No, we can only accept his invitation to know him as father through adoption. God has no grandchildren, only children. And we must be adopted into that family individually. When we join his family through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, here's what happens. The Holy Spirit of God comes alive in us. Has that happened to anyone in this room? Okay, good. A couple people. Rob, has it happened? Okay, last time he said it didn't happen to him. That's right. Okay, we've got to pray for Rob. He's singing the songs. We need him to know Jesus. But anyway, that's what happened last time. But here's the thing. Then and then alone does he empower us to live like his children. See, it's not about do, 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 do. No, that's do, do, right? No, 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 no. It's about what he's done. And then he gives me the power to do what he's called me to do. Did you catch that? What about Cece? Did you catch that? Is that good? You got it? So, okay, just making sure it's clear. I can't always tell. Um, God wants us to know him. And he asks that our old self be crucified with him so that his power can live in us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. If you don't know it, oh goodness, check it out today. That his power is that which infuses us, empowers us, regenerates us to live the life that he's called us to live. This is a relational thing with God's spirit. It's not a religious thing about a service. Does that make sense? God wants us to know him, to draw near to him, to love him. That's not religion. That's relationship. That's Nehemiah. That's so many of you. Look, it's blue skies. Yesterday it was not. And you know where you chose to be? Here loving Jesus. That's awesome. You don't have to be here. 
Hopefully it's like, I want to be there, to sing his praises, to hear his word, to give to his kingdom, to serve his people, to be in connection with others. Like, what blue sky, that's awesome, but like, I want to be with his people. That's love. Love is so much more powerful than law. And this is Nehemiah. He's impacted in the heart. But you know that second phrase that we talked about this morning? You know, when you don't know what to do, do know what you know to do? I learned that from a guy named John Corson. See, Nehemiah was in a tight spot, so he prayed. There will be times in life where you're going to go, I don't know what to do. There's a lot in here that you do know to do. You know that you're called to experience new life in Jesus. If you have not realized that God loves you, recognize that you're a sinner in need of his grace that's only available in Jesus, then you should repent of your sins and receive Jesus. There's your first step. Salvation. Okay, say, I did that. Well, have you been baptized? Why? Because if you don't, you're not going to heaven. No, 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 no. But it's the way to declare publicly that you belong to him. No, I haven't done that. Sign up. Easter Sunday, we hope to do it. Have you taken first steps with this church? Say, what is first steps? Well, it's a free dinner and dessert. Well, yeah, sign me up. Like April 11th is our next first steps class. That's an opportunity for you to discover who our church is and discern if this is a good fit. I think that's a good thing to do. So well, yeah, I've done first steps. Start coming to a worship gathering. What's a worship gathering? You're doing it. Look at, look at you, you're doing it. You're learning God's word. You're singing his praises. You're fellowshipping with his people. You're giving, you're serving. Then go to a connect group and then learn how to servant lead your own life. And there's training coming on that soon, trust me. These are the steps, spiritually. We want to help you be who God has empowered you to be in Jesus' name. And when you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. If you say, I don't know what to do, start reading this. And this is what I always do. If I don't know what to do, I read this and then I ask Pastor Joe, Joe, what do I do next? Like, he knows. He's been here 25 years. If you're like, if I don't know what to do, go ask Pastor Joe. So his, his email is joe at coastlinelife.com. I'm going to share his phone number right now, his physical address. He wants you over there, you know, hang out with Joe. Talk to someone, talk to someone. When you don't know what to do, do what you know to do. This is about a relationship, not about a religion. And thirdly, and finally, it's about availability, not about ability. Look at verses six and seven in the book of Nehemiah chapter one. If you're still awake, let me know by saying Jesus is Lord. Okay, if you believe that, you're saved. That's the Bible. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people. I have sinned, even our whole family. Yes, we've sinned terribly. But look, I'm here. See, in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, this is what Nehemiah is basically saying. God, I'm here. Use me for your will, for your glory, for the good of others. And you know what God says? Sorry, I can't. No. He doesn't say, well, what's your resume? Tell me about your educational experiences. Do you know the difference between the hypostatic union for those that believe that and those that don't? No, God doesn't say that stuff. Anyone that starts saying that stuff, say, hey, look, man, go read a book. But here, let's get involved in helping people know Jesus. Here's the beautiful thing about God calling people to follow him. It is not about ability. It's about availability. Maybe you've heard this phrase. God equips the called. He does not always call the equipped. Read 1 Corinthians that God loves to use the foolish things of the world. If you feel like, man, I've blown it. I could never. No, that's not true. If you have breath in your lungs, God wants to rebuild and restore. Listen to me. Please listen to this. You are not damaged goods. You are not a waste. You are not an accident. God loves you 
and desires to fill you with his spirit. And you matter. You matter. And if I could say this, and don't take this too far, but today needs you. That's why you still have life. Forget yesterday. It's done. Tomorrow you don't have it. It may never come for you, but you do have today. Today. So live it to the hilt. Forget about yesterday. It's over. Wake up and live life to the fullest now. And the best way to do that is through a loving relationship with the one who designed you. That's just logical. The one who designs me and loves me, that's who I should be listening to. Stay connected to the people who think that same way. And then start to fill your job description. Well, what's that? The Great Commission. And then you know what's going to happen? Unfortunately, something will be taken from you. Boredom. (laughs) You'll go, I got so much to do now. Like, there's all these people that need to know Jesus and, like, people I can help with. And, like, there's just too much to do. You'll get to experience life to the fullest. See, here's the deal. Not only was he available, but please listen to this is where we'll close. He was available right where he was. That's why at the end of chapter one, he doesn't introduce himself as a cupbearer, but at the end he says, and at that time, I was the cupbearer. So he's processing. What do I do with that position? Well, you might say, well, who in the world is a cupbearer? Next Sunday, Pastor John will speak more definitively about that. But what's interesting, it's more than a modern day butler. It was a position of great responsibility and privilege. At the meal, the the cupbearer would ensure that nothing that touched the lips of the king would kill him. But also, a guy that stood that close to the king in public, here were some of the job descriptions and specifics that had to be met. He had to be handsome, so I'm out, right? He had to be cultured. I guess you can't use the word stoked. Like He had to be knowledgeable in court proceedings and be able to converse with the king and advise him when asked. Oh, so this is like a cultured, good-looking, capable, intelligent man. And this is what he says. God, my position is yours because that which has been given to me is a gift. I recognize that. See, here's what I want to say. This tells me that Nehemiah didn't complain about his situation or seek to get out of it. He flourished in it. You and I are called to a certain degree to bloom where you're planted. Stop looking for tomorrow. Live today. He's a cupbearer. Are you unemployed? What does God want to do with that? Are you a homemaker? What does God want to do with that? Say nothing. How could God ever? Nothing. God can take ashes and turn them into beauty. He can take years that locusts have eaten and restore them. Don't come to God and say you can't because he can. He can. He wants to use you right where you are. But here's what he's looking for. Okay, I'm ready. Whatever that means. I don't even know what word to use. But here I am. Take your Bibles and turn to one last passage with me, if you would. It's in Matthew chapter 26. And I don't have time to read the 10 verses I would love to read to you. But I will ask that if you have time and interest, that you would read verses 36 through 46 before this day's sun sets. Why? This seems like left field. What is this? To me, Nehemiah chapter 1 points me to Jesus. How? In many ways, but let me share one. Jesus is our God and our King and our Savior and our resurrected one. But he's also an example to follow. Jesus solved the problem of sin. I cannot do that for you. There's only one who has pure blood that can do that. But here's what I can learn from Jesus and can follow in. Remember when Jesus faced a perplexing situation in the Garden of Gethsemane? What did he do? Like Nehemiah, 
He prayed. Like Nehemiah, there was humility. There was truth and clarity and confession and justice and honesty and history and request and trust and release. Just like Nehemiah in the Garden of Gethsemane. See, in verses 36 through 46, we're told this story of where Jesus actually sweat as great drops of blood. I would call that a perplexing evening. If you're, you're so consumed by what's in front of you that it's causing hematosis biologically, that's a challenging day. And Jesus, if you would, I won't read all of the text to you, but it says in verse 42 after he left his disciples because he caught them sleeping, he says in verse 42, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them, speaking of the disciples again, he found them sleeping for they could not keep their eyes open. So he went again to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest. But look, the time has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners up. Let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. In verse 42, Jesus basically said, if this cup cannot pass, if this is the only way that Matt can be restored, if this is the only way that David can know Jesus, if this is the only way that Rob can get saved, then bring it. Let it happen. You say, well, what was he so concerned about? The physical death? Other men have navigated the flagellum. Other men have been crucified to trees. Is Jesus worried here about physical death? I would never assume to know what Jesus was thinking in that moment. Never, maybe. But I will also give you one theological consideration. Eloi. Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those are the words that Jesus uttered on the cross. Well, what does that mean? Again, I don't want to assume I wasn't there, but let me give you one potential consideration. Jesus experienced something you will never experience. The Holy Father turned his back on his son so that he would never have to do that to you. You ever been betrayed? You ever had someone physically stand up and turn their back against you? I'm sorry that that happened to you. But that's never happened to you from God the Father. It did to Jesus. And he said, I'll take it. If that means that they will never have to experience that. That's a love like I don't know. That's a love that I'll be honest, I don't have for you. I don't. I don't know. I, I can't even do that. I, I don't qualify. I don't have pure blood. <laughs> but Jesus did. And Jesus said this, you are worth it. You are worth me experiencing this dynamic. That the weight of every single grotesque sin that we as a culture would despise, Jesus says, call me that. Call me that. I'll be the fill in the blank, whatever you want to call that. So that you can experience life. So that you can know what it's like to be loved. So that you can be connected. And so that you can have purpose. Jesus died in every way imaginable, so that you could have a relationship with God. Jesus was perplexed, so he prayed in the garden. And Jesus, read Philippians chapter 2, position meant nothing to him. He submitted to the Father and was able and available to go to the cross and rise again. That's who Jesus is. He's not the one pulling the hair out of those don't follow, that, that don't follow him. He's the one allowing his beard to be plucked so that you could follow him. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the one who rebuilds and restores. Jesus came from heaven to earth to show the way. Jesus went 
from the cradle to the cross, our debt to pay. Jesus went from the cross to the grave and from the grave to the sky so that our lives could be lived to lift him on high. Jesus and Jesus alone rebuilds and restores. And let me ask you this last question. Do you know him? Show me. Show me in your attitudes and actions and choices and beliefs. Let me just say this last thing and I'll invite the worship team up as we close out with this. My wife and I went to an area in which we used to spend a lot of time over the weekend. Uh, the area of Destin, San Destin, 30A, lived down there for seven years, worked there for 10. And so we, everywhere we would go, you, at the restaurant, there's, oh, there's so-and-so in the grocery store. Oh, there's so-and-so at the Disney store. Oh, there's so-and-so at the, uh, wherever we are. Oh, there's so-and-so. There's a lot of so-and-sos, you know what I'm saying? And uh, my wife, you know, I don't know if you know about this in Destin, you can shop there. And so my wife likes that dynamic. So she's shopping in a situation that I didn't really want to hang out in. So like, well, I'll just go walk around, you know, see if there's a so-and-so somewhere, you know, that kind of thing. And so I step into this store, and I don't, I don't really know this lady, and I'm looking at things, asking her some questions. She starts to pick up on, like, how do you know so many people around here? I said, well, I'm not born here, but I was from here for a moment. Um, and so she started to pick up that I knew some kids in the area, like teenagers. She said, did you know Connor? I said, well, man, there's a lot of Connors. I, I don't know who, of whom you speak. She said, yes, you do. I can tell by everyone that you know. Connor, the, the one that took his life like two and a half years ago, did you know Connor? I said, oh, you mean Mason and Connor and Nathan and Harrison and Zach. She said, yeah, do you know them? I said, I never had the opportunity to know Connor. But the day he died, by his own hand, many of those families began reaching out to me. So I did get connected to the living, Harrison, and Zach, and Nathan, and a host of others. But I said, this is a little out of left field. Why are you asking me this question? She said, well, do you know the story of why Connor died? I said, I know what I was told, that he was heartbroken over a relationship with the girl. She said, that, that's my daughter. I said, okay. Well, what are you asking of me? How, how can I help? I don't, know what, I don't know what you need. She said, I just want to share with you a story. I said, okay, I can, I can hear a story. My wife's shopping. I got all the time in the world. Trust me. She said, my daughter was, was ruined over that. I said, I understand. I said, I spent many nights and days and events with many of those kids. I know your daughter now that you've spoken of who she is. I, she said, I know. I was in your church. You did some event. I said, yes, we did some things. She was grateful for those things, but she said, I just want to tell you, I just got a text message from her right when you walked in. I was like, oh, okay. Well, what's the text message? She said, Mom, I'm, I'm in such and such town and blah, 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 and there's this guy that's like homeless, and Mom, we're praying for him. And she said, you don't know how, how sweet it is to hear my daughter speak about wanting to do something for the Lord again, because that's who she was. And, and when this happened with the death, and there's just been so much challenge, and so she said, I just wanted to share this story with you that, that there is restoration, that, that Jesus can and does rebuild, even in the midst of the darkest of days. And she shared with me about what college she's going to be going to, how she's graduating from high school. And I just said, thank you for sharing that. I do know your family. And I won't mention the names and things, but all the different ways I know all these family people. But... Um, I said, if there's ever anything that we can do, hopefully we won't meet again under these circumstances. But um, know that God loves you. Because I don't know if I'll ever see Miss So-and-So again. But um, in that moment, by God's grace, there was a little bit of lining to that cloudy day that happened a few years ago. And I was encouraged that God, you still are in the business of restoring. You're still in the business of rebuilding and redeeming. I don't want to see any more teenage death. 
So in humility, God, do something. Pour out your spirit. Use us if you can. Thank you for the stories of the living that are now seeking you. And for those that are gone, we, we thank you for the opportunity to know them. But I, I, I say all this to say, I didn't plan on stepping into that, either of those situations. The situation with the family members and those that navigated those terrible waters of suicide. But I didn't plan to step into that little shop and talk to Miss So-and-so. But I, I'm always trying to do this. If I can, if I'm smart enough, I guess I'm awake enough. God, whatever you need me to do, just tell me what it is. I don't know what it is. I'm not that smart. Please just keep showing me. One lady came in today about a book that I had recommended earlier, and she said, hey, how, 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 how do you practice the presence of God? And I said, you know, for me, it's just an awareness of his thereness. And she had another whole approach. Like, wow, that approach is awesome, too. Like, she had, like, a more visual approach. And I said, mine's more like a mental approach. Just recognize that I don't bring Jesus into any situation. He's already there. So I'm just going to do my best to try and pay attention. Like, oh, what, what's going on? <laughs> and I sometimes, I, a lot of times, miss it. But every once in a while, oh, there it is. That's why I'm in this store. Okay. Uh, awesome. Thank you for sharing that story. Like, I, you know, like, um, I'm just trying to tell you that there's a lot of people out there that need to know Jesus, and he wants to use you. Either for the first time, they don't know Jesus at all, or they just need to be reminded that day that Jesus loves them. You, you can do that. Like, you can do that. If you're to borrow the old phrase from two years ago, if you're woke, right, if you're awake, if you're listening, if you're paying attention to, to what God's Spirit is saying.